With that all said, I would like to introduce tonight's guest speaker. He is a, an associate professor of theology at Houston Baptist University and the president of Risen Jesus Incorporated. He has a master's in religious studies and a PhD in New Testament from the University of Pretoria. And he currently runs TruthQuest Ministries and is a member of the Evangelical Theolo Theological and Philosophical Societies, the Institute for Biblical Research, the Society of Biblical Liter Literature, and the Studitorum Novi Testamenti Societas. That is complicated. As if that wasn't enough, he is also fluent in Koine Greek and is the author of many books, including The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, Cross Examined, and The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Mike Lacona. If God does not exist, then injustices will be unanswered, goodness will be unrewarded, and death is final. To imagine such things, for me, is a horrifying thing. I sincerely hope it is false. But there is another side to look at, and it's this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God loved the world so intensely that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Now, that's good news, if it's true. But a Christian can hope and imagine all they want that it's true, and it's not going to move it one inch closer to being true. And likewise, Lenin and his wife could want to imagine and hope that atheism is true, and it's not going to move them one inch closer, one inch closer to being true. You got to look at evidence. And so that's what I want to do for the next few moments. I want to look at evidence. You see, the earliest proclamation of the Christians after Jesus died is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, this is something that every scholar out there, no matter how skeptical, acknowledges. God raised Jesus from the dead. So in relation to this, I want to ask and answer four key questions. The first is, how do we know that the earliest Christians were saying this, that God had raised Jesus from the dead? Well, let's take a look. I want to look at a little timeline here. And at the start of this timeline, we see the Jesus crucifixion that happened in either April of 30 or April of 33. We don't know. Scholars are split about 50-50 on it. Doesn't really matter. The first gospel Mark, uh, is Mark, uh, most scholars do think. Probably 95% of scholars today think that Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke came after Mark. Um, now, uh, m most scholars do think that Mark was written between the years 65 and 70. In fact, I supervised a an MA thesis for a student, one of my students at, at HBU. And uh, he um, surveyed, he found 207 critical New Testament scholars writing from 1965 through 2019. And um, I had him look in three different areas. Uh, one area was, when do these scholars think Mark was, was written? Uh, what are the, who do they think the author really was? And was Peter uh, uh, the author's primary source, as church tradition says. And he found that of those 207 critical scholars, by far the majority placed Mark between 65 and 70. There are some out there, New Testament scholars, who place Mark later, but only about 10% place Mark um, after the year 70. And there are far more scholars who place Mark earlier, and some place Mark even in the 40s. In fact, two agnostic New Testament scholars placed Mark in the 40s. But by far, most say around 65 to 70. Matthew and Luke between 70 and 80, and then John somewhere between 90 and 95. Now, what I want to do this evening is I want to focus on just this period of time that occurred between the crucifixion and when the first gospel of Mark was written. I want to focus on that period of time because a lot happened during that period. So let's look here. You've got a guy named Paul. And um, he wrote 
some letters that we have in the New Testament. There are 13 letters attributed to Paul in the New Testament. Um, scholars are unanimous that he wrote seven of them. On the other six, they're split in, in different ways. So on the other six, there are um, two of them that just a little over 50% of them think Paul wrote. And then the other four, most scholars don't think Paul wrote them. Some think that he did, but uh, most would say no. Um, I'm, that's not a concern for us this evening. What is a concern and anything I quote from Paul are going to be from those undisputed letters written by Paul. So you have Paul, he writes these letters that are in the New Testament. And they all come before uh, the Gospels. Now, Paul was this, this uh, he was more than a skeptic. Um, he was like the Taliban against the Christians. Okay, so he was a uh, Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee. He was just really zealous for the law, the Jewish law. And he believed that, um, that Christianity was a cult, a dangerous cult. And so he believed that it was God's will for him to help destroy that cult. And so he went out arresting Christians, throwing them in prison, and consenting to their execution for being Christians. And then one day he's out and he has an experience that he's convinced is an appearance of the risen Jesus to them, to him. And it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. And later on, we find around the year 64 that Paul was beheaded in Rome or just outside the city and became a Christian martyr. So he's pretty profound. Um, now, in one of his undisputed letters, Galatians, uh, one that he wrote to the church in Galatia, he says in chapter one that three years after his conversion, and by the way, most scholars think that he converted he had this experience one to three years after Jesus' death. So then Paul says, three years after his conversion, so this is within six years of Jesus' crucifixion, he says he goes up to Jerusalem, and while he's up in Jerusalem, he spends 15 days with the lead apostle, Peter, who is one of Jesus' three closest disciples. And he said he also met James, the Lord's brother at that time. Yeah, Jesus had brothers. In fact, the Gospels report he had four brothers. And, and the Gospels named them, but James was one of them. Um, now, here's what's interesting. <clears throat> when he's up meeting, what the Greek word that Paul uses there is hysteresi, which ha carries with it a meaning of inquiry and meaning and history. We get the, the English word history from it. So Paul is trying to get an account of what um, from Peter of what happened. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me all about Jesus. You were with him. Tell me about him. So he spent 15 days with Peter. That would have been a pretty cool time, wouldn't it have been? And then Paul says 14 years later, he goes back up to Jerusalem. And now this time he's running the gospel message he had been preaching. He runs that gospel message past the pillars of the church, and he names them Peter, James, and John. So it's the second time meeting Peter and James, and now he's meeting John, another one of Jesus' three closest disciples. Now, wouldn't that be awesome to sit down and to meet with those three, Jesus' brother and two of Jesus' three closest disciples? And he says the reason for going up was he wanted to run the gospel message. Now, remember this. The gospel message. He wanted to run that past the pillars of the church, Peter, James, and John, to make sure that he was on message with what they were preaching. And he said they extended the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they were saying, "Good, you're good, Paul. Keep up the good work, brother. You're on message with what we're preaching. Now, of course, Paul might have been lying about that. So, as historians, we say, is there any evidence to suggest that Paul was telling the truth here? And the answer to that is yes. So, we got a guy named Polycarp. And we can't be sure of this, but we've got a guy named Irenaeus toward the end of the second century. He said he had met Polycarp. He'd heard Polycarp uh, preach. And Polycarp actually knew the Apostle John. And Polycarp writes about Paul, and this is important because John was one of the three that Paul allegedly ran the gospel message past and said that John approved. 
So if Polycarp knew John, and if, if Paul was preaching something essentially different than Polycarp, then you got problems, right? So let's see what, what Polycarp says about Paul. Paul. He says, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. So that would seem to suggest that Paul was correct when he said he was preaching the same gospel message as the Jerusalem apostles. And then we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And it's kind of, it's interesting. Paul's going to talk about marriage and divorce in that chapter. So what's that got to do with showing Paul preaching the same as the Jerusalem apostles? Well, it's kind of interesting. His first, he's answering three questions in this chapter about marriage and divorce. And the first uh, question he's answering is, Paul, is it okay to get married? Some people are thinking maybe they're going to be celibate for life. And Paul, is it okay to be married? And Paul says, well, there are, are some benefits to being celibate. You'll have more time and resources to devote to the kingdom. But, you know, if sexual temptation is too tough, then by all means get married. He says, this is my, this is my opinion. Then he says, he answers the second question. The second question is, Paul, is it okay to get divorced? And he says at this point, not I, but the Lord. In other words, it's not a matter of um, Paul's opinion anymore. This is the teaching of Jesus I'm about to give you. And he gives the same thing we find in the Gospels. Unless your spouse cheats on you sexually, then you need to stay married to them. Okay? And then he's answering the third question. But Paul, what if I'm married to a non-believer? And then Paul makes that kind of interesting statement. Not the Lord, but I. Well, what does that mean, Paul? Is this no longer the red letter edition we're looking at here? Does this mean I don't have to listen to you? Now, what Paul is saying here in this verse uh, is, and what he's about to teach is, look, Jesus gave no teachings on this. So when I said, not, me, not I, but the Lord, it's not opinion. This is the teaching of the Lord. Not the Lord, but I. We're back now that this isn't what Jesus taught. He didn't give any teaching on this. So I'm going to render a, 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 a policy on this as an apostle. And he says, you need to obey this, and this is to be taught in all the churches. And so he says, look, if you're married to a non-believer and they want a divorce, then let them get divorced. You can get divorced, and you can remarry a, a, a Christian. But if your non-believing spouse wants to stay married, then you need to stay married to them. And this is pass this along the church. All right, why do I bring this up? <clears throat> because Paul is being painfully careful here to distinguish his teachings, even an apostolic ruling that is binding, he's carefully to distinguish that from the words of Jesus. He's not going to commingle it. He had an opportunity to do that and to just muddy the thing a little bit, but he didn't do it. He was very careful to, to keep the Jesus teaching, the Jesus tradition in its integrity. Paul is not going to make stuff up and put it on the lips of Jesus. So if he's this way, we can be sure that when um, we are hearing Paul on the gospel message, we are likewise hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. He's not making stuff up. Now, wouldn't it be great then if we had maybe archaeologists all of a sudden come across some kind of a lost letter of Paul that said, um, I want to remind you of the gospel message that I preached to you. And then he gets into it. Wouldn't that be awesome? It's like this would be historical gold because now we would know, even apart from the gospels, we could know what Jesus' apostles were preaching after his crucifixion. Well, we don't need a lost letter of Paul because we actually have one of Paul's undisputed letters in our New Testament that says just that. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he begins verse 1 by saying, Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel message that I preach to you. And now he's going to give us an outline of that message. And he starts this off in verse 3 and he says, I delivered to you what I also received. Now these were two technical terms back then for the imparting of oral tradition that was going to be stylized, formalized and is passed around word of mouth, but because it's formalized, it's stylized, it makes it easy to memorize. 
It's not like the game of telephone. So he delivered to them what he had also received. When, he, when did he deliver it to them? Well, most scholars believe that 1 Corinthians was written no later than the year 57. They believe that it was written between the years 53 and 57. It's hard to narrow it more than that. And they, but most agreed that he established the church in Corinth around the year 51. So he delivered it to them in the year 51. And of course, he received it prior to then. When? We don't know. We can take some guesses, but we really don't know. But of course, if this is oral tradition, it would, it would almost certainly go back to the apostles in Jerusalem. So the alleged eyewitnesses themselves. And remember, the gospel message he was preaching is the same when they were. So let's see what these apostles were saying. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. So you had the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and appearances to others. And then Paul is going to proceed to list some appearances. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 at one time. And Paul adds, most of them are still alive, but some have died. In other words, if you go to Jerusalem, a lot of these people are still alive. And you can talk to them about this appearance of Jesus. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And then Paul said, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So notice here, you got three individual appearances, Peter, James, and Paul. And you have three group appearances to the 12, to, all, uh, to uh, more than 500, and all of the apostles. And we'll get back to those group appearances in a moment because they're important. And then Paul goes on in the same chapter and he says, Whether I or they, that is the other apostles, this is what we preached and this is what you believed. So the other apostles, Paul saying, yep. They're, they're, uh, this is in another undisputed letter of Paul. He says they're, they're preaching this too. So we know that the apostles are preaching Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and appearances to individuals and to groups. Question number two. What did they mean by resurrection? What did they mean when they said Jesus rose from the dead? Well, that's fairly easy to answer. Some have said, well, resurrection just meant, you know, he was vindicated by God in heaven. Others said, well, it was a spiritual thing. He wasn't raised bodily. It was just he, he came alive in spirit, but his body would have still been decomposing somewhere. Others, the traditional interpretation of resurrection is that his body was raised physically from the dead. So what does it mean? Well, let's go back to Paul. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15... What he is doing in this chapter is he's answering questions. In chapter 7, he answered questions about marriage and divorce. Chapter 15, he's answering questions about re, uh, the afterlife and resurrection. There are actually some people in Corinth who are telling the Christians there, you guys are wasting your time. You think there's a general resurrection. I know the Jews have been teaching for years, and now you Christians are teaching it, that there's going to be this general resurrection when God returns on the final day, the day of judgment, there's going to be a resurrection of all the dead. They're going to come back to life, their bodies, everything, they're going to come back to life, and you're going to live happily ever after in heaven forever. Let me tell you, that's not going to happen. Um, there is no resurrection. This life is all there is. So you just need to imagine there's no heaven. You need to imagine there's no hell. It's the only sky above us and live life for today. John Lennon and Yoko Ono would have been very proud of those skeptics in Corinth. And so there, these Christians in the, in the church in Corinth are saying to Paul in a letter, they're writing a letter to him and say, Paul, all right, we do believe that there's a general resurrection, but what's it going to be like? What's resurrection going to be like? Are, are we going to have bodies? What's the deal here? And so Paul goes on to answer that. And he says, um, if, look, resurrection is really important. He says, look, if Jesus is the first fruits, in verse 20 of, of chapter 20, it says, Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. In other words, he's the first to be raised with a resurrection body. And in verse 23, he says, the rest of us are going to be resurrected when Christ returns. So 
Then he, he goes on and he says, look, the general resurrection started with Jesus. The rest of us are going to complete the general resurrection when he returns. It's all part of the general resurrection. The two are inseparable. So if we're not going to be raised, then that means Christ was not raised. All right. And then he says, basically, if Christ was not raised, your faith is worthless. He says this in verse 17. Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And those who have died as believers in Christ are forever gone. They're like my dog. You're never going to see them again. Okay. So get rid of all your hopes and just live life for today. And Paul goes on to say, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Get all the sex you want. Get all the weed you want. Cheat on your tests. Don't tell him, right? Don't tell him, these guys, these professors. But cheat on your tests as long as you don't get caught. All right. It doesn't matter. This life is all there is. Just do whatever you want to get the maximum amount of pleasure out of life. That kind of makes sense. My wife said to me once, she said, you know, but even if Christianity wasn't true, I think I'd still follow. It'd still be worth being a Christian. I said, are you kidding? No way. Because a lot of people in the world, they suffer persecution and martyrdom for being Christians. Um, even here in the United States, most in a lot of places now, you're going to pay a price for being a Christian if you stand up for your faith, even in our country now. So it's like even Paul said, if the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. I'm joining Paul with that, folks, if, if Christ is not raised. So here's, here's his basic argument. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then we're not going to be raised from the dead. And if we're not going to be raised, the Christian life is not worth living. Because it often involves sacrifice and persecution. But Christ was raised. Therefore, we will be raised. Therefore, the Christian life is, is worth living. And that argument makes no sense whatsoever. Unless they meant by resurrection that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. It's not a metaphor for, well, we still sense his presence when we take communion. Or his memory and his teachings still live on today. Question number three, is it true? All right, so we see, yes, they were proclaiming God had raised Jesus from the dead. Um, we know the meaning of resurrection. They really meant that Jesus was raised from the dead. And then three, is it true? Well, here you got to look and you weigh hypotheses. So you look at three facts here, just three facts. Number one, Jesus' disciples taught he was raised from the dead. And what does that mean just from that fact? Well, we know it wasn't a legend that developed over time because the original alleged eyewitnesses were, were uh, saying it. You say, well, maybe they were lying. Well, it wasn't a lie. Why? It probably wasn't a lie. Why? Well, because we have about a dozen ancient sources that inform us that these disciples were willing to suffer continuously and did for their gospel proclamation. We even have early, fairly early reports and multiple reports that there were at least Peter and uh, Paul were martyred and that James, the brother of Jesus, was martyred. And there's reports that all the rest of them were, but a lot of those reports are late. They might be true. They may not be. There's no way to verify it. But scholars are pretty much agreed that at least three of them uh, died as martyrs and all of them did suffer tremendously for their gospel proclamation so they were at least willing to die, even if they didn't end up being martyred. And what does this prove? Does it prove Jesus was actually raised? No. But it does show that they truly believed that he was. Um, liars make poor martyrs, right? And you say, well, wait a minute. You do have jihadists who are willing to die for their cause. That's true. They are. But they're dying for it because they believe it's true. You don't have a jihadist say, hey, what would you like me to do? And they say, well, Al-Qaeda says, we want you to put this bomb on your back and go into this populated place and blow yourself and all those people up. And they think to themselves, well, let's see, Muhammad was a false prophet. The Quran is not from God. And if I do kill all these people, the real God may send me to hell forever. Sign me up. 
Now they're doing it because they sincerely believe Islam is true. And that's why the early Christian, the, the apostles did. They believed it was true that Jesus was raised from the dead. But there is a difference between modern jihadists and same thing can be said about Christians who are martyred today. They die for what they believe is true, but for all they know, it may not be. Muslim jihadists die for what they believe is true, but for all they know, it may not be. The apostles, the disciples of Jesus were willing to die because they claimed they had actually seen Jesus. They either knew he really rose from the dead or they really knew that he didn't. And so there's a difference between dying for what you know is true and dying for what you know is false. There's a huge difference. Liars make poor martyrs. So the disciples were not only proclaiming that Jesus rose and appeared to them, they actually believed it. So they weren't lying. Second fact, Jesus' disciples taught he appeared to individuals and to groups. So it wasn't a hallucination. Why do I, why do I say this? Well, hallucinations don't typically lead one to believe in an empty grave, that if you went and you visited that person uh, in the cemetery, that their grave would be gone uh, or, or vacant. Hallucinations also, it's interesting to, to, uh, to, to learn some about hallucinations. So when you study it and you talk to the experts and you see multiple studies, you find that, that hallucinations have been studied pretty extensively for more than a century. And you find that um, only 7% of those who are grieving, and those grieving are the ones most likely to experience a hallucination, but you find only 7% of them experience a visual hallucination of someone. But here what you have is you have 100% of Jesus' followers saying, he appeared to me. So that's one problem. Another problem is you have these group appearances. Now what mental health professionals have found in their studies is that hallucinations are private occurrences in the mind of an individual. They have no external reality to them, of course, right? They're false sensory perceptions. So in a sense, they're like dreams. Now, I couldn't wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, honey, I'm having a dream. I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep. Join me in my dream. Let's have a free vacation. I couldn't do that, right? She could go back to sleep. May, maybe we both go back to sleep and we dream, both dream we're in Maui, but we're not having the same dream. Okay. She, we don't wake up and she say, you know, Mike, you were you know, on that boogie board and that big wave came and wiped you out. And I was really worried because it took you about 20 seconds to, to come out uh, to the surface. And I wouldn't be saying, I know, I was scared too. I didn't know that I was going to make it. That doesn't happen. You can't share a dream with someone because a dream isn't happening. It's just something that's going on in, in your brain. It has no external reality. You cannot share your dream. And it's the same thing with hallucinations. You know, it's interesting. There was a book I read, a textbook published by the American Psychological Association. I think it was published in 2007. It's called uh, Hallucinations, the Science of Idiosyncratic Perception. And in uh, the two authors, Ailman and Laura E., and I emailed them and asked them why in their textbook they did not cover group hallucinations. And Laura E. got back to me and he said, we couldn't find any documented cases of group hallucinations. And from what we understand about hallucinations, group hallucinations can't happen anyway. But we couldn't find a single documented case of a group hallucination. Group delusions, yes. Uh, but, or uh, group optical illusions, yes. But not group hallucinations. So that's a problem because you've got the group experiences. You've got um, also you have Paul. Paul was not grieving Jesus' death. Paul believed Jesus was a failed Messiah and a false prophet. So Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that Paul would have expected to see or wanted to see. So hallucinations just don't work. And three, Jesus' disciples intended for us to interpret the resurrection as an actual event. I went over this with Paul, right? Christ was not raised, we're not going to be raised. If we're not going to be raised, the Christian life is not worth living. Christ was raised, therefore we will be raised, therefore the Christian life is worth living. This argument makes no sense of Paul's, 
um, if he didn't mean, he and the disciples didn't mean that Jesus was truly raised from the dead. So it wasn't a metaphor. So, our fourth and final question, does it matter? All right, so our first three questions, how do we know that they were really saying God raised Jesus from the dead? Well, we know it. There's enough evidence for it. That's accepted by virtually 100% of all critical scholars out there. Second question, what do they mean by, by, by resurrection? Um, we saw what that meant. Um, the third question, what was the third question? <laughs> Is it true? Um, and we looked and we see that the resurrection hypothesis, this doesn't prove beyond all doubt, of course, that Jesus rose from the dead. What historians do is you look at different hypotheses and you see which one of them, which one of these hypotheses best explains the data. And we haven't covered everything here, but we've just seen what the little bit that I've shared. We've looked at some of the major alternative hypotheses and we've seen just these few facts refute some of the major alternative hypotheses out there. Does it matter? Yes, it absolutely matters. Truth matters. Imagine going into your professor tomorrow, they give you back a test that you took and it's got some stuff marked wrong on it, right? So you go up to your professor and say, you marked this wrong on my test, but you don't understand, this is my truth. This is my truth. Who are you to tell me I'm wrong? You do that a few times and your truth will be that you are no longer a student here. Truth matters. Truth matters. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is a false religion. So there's false hope. You and I should not follow Christ. If it's a false religion, we'd be idiots to do that. Count me out. The the, the stock has gone bankrupt. It's no longer worth anything. Even Paul says to get out of it if, if, uh, if Christ was not raised from the dead. That's truth. If Christ was not raised, Christianity is a false religion. But if Christ was raised, as the evidence seems to suggest, then Christianity is almost certainly true. And you know what that means? It means God exists. You don't have to just imagine it. It means Christianity is true. It means he loves you. He loves you passionately. And it means that you, each and every one of you, have immense value. Not because of anything you've ever done. Not because for those of you who are doing your doctorates right now and projects that you might have for anything that that might uncover for, for the future. You have intimate value because of who you are created in God's image. And finally, if Christ rose from the dead, it means that injustices will be answered. Goodness will be rewarded and death is not final. And that is awesome news indeed. Well, that's uh, what I got for you. So how about if I open it up for some questions and, um, Feel free to ask what you want on that. And if, if some of you here tonight are, are not Christians and you're just here to hear a knucklehead talk about this stuff or you're, you're seeking, um, ask, you know, feel free to push back on some of this. I'm not going to embarrass you. I, I appreciate the fact that you're here. Um, so feel free to push back on anything that I've said or, or raise something. So let's open up for questions. And I see this being recorded, so I'll hear, I'll repeat the question, and then... Uh... Oh, we'll uh, we have mics that shouldn't capture everything. Oh, so. cool. Okay. Do you think that the garden tomb is the most likely site where Christ was buried, or the site where the church is built on a site? I've been to both, twice. And I'm not an archaeologist, but I can tell you that it's almost unanimous among those who do study this stuff. They're very convinced that it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and not the Garden Tomb. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, a couple of things. One, I really like what you said about the resurrection being such a central part of Christianity. It reminds me of this quote I heard from a church historian who said, if Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, 
then nothing else matters. Like it's just a central part of our faith and of the entire world. I did want to ask, can you explain sort of the difference between the maximal and minimal facts approaches? Because I've heard these uh, terms be thrown around a lot in historical criticism, and I'm not sure about if I understand what they mean. Yeah, so the minimal facts approach is something that was coined by a mentor of mine named Gary Habermas. And he, um, the way he uses it now, he's like doing minimal facts 2.0, as I said to, to Julie a little earlier today. So to keep my answer short, I'll just say what 2.0 is, okay? So minimal facts 2.0, what he has done, and he probably knows this stuff better than anyone in the world. Um, he's studied for so long and it's been his thing. So he takes facts that are granted by virtually every scholar who studies the subject, even skeptics, okay? And I'm talking about people who are in the relevant fields, you know? Someone like Richard Dawkins, as smart as he is, he's not a historian, so he wouldn't weigh in on something like this. Um, so he would look at that and say, all right, what facts are there that virtually everyone agrees on? A least common denominator kind of thing. And then he says, you know, we can build a, a pretty good case for the resurrection just on those facts. Now, I think I've built a kind of a neat case for the resurrection built on just a, a couple of facts here this evening and been able to eliminate a number of alternative hypotheses. Um, but I'm only going to use those things that you know, are granted by virtually everyone. Why? Even skeptics believe it because the data is so strong and compelling. So it's not a matter that I believe this because, well, you know, I'm going to, as a Christian, I'm going to be more inclined to believe church tradition. So when church tradition says, John the son of Zebedee wrote the Gospel of John, I'm going to have an inclination to believe that. I'm going to have a bias, a predisposition to, to buy into that. The majority of critical New Testament scholars today don't buy into it. They don't think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the Gospel of John. So um, now I do think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote it, but I'm in a minority of scholars okay, um, who, who, who think that. Now, the majority of scholars do think, even though they reject John, the son of Zebedee, they do think that the beloved disciple is a different disciple than John, the son of Zebedee. And they think the Gospel of John was either written by the beloved disciple or the beloved disciple provided most of the information to the author that's in that Gospel. That's still pretty good, okay? But as Christians, we're going to be more inclined to accept church tradition than, say, someone who's not. And our bias might lead us astray. I mean, that's plain and simple. Just as a skeptic's bias um, and maybe not wanting Christianity to be true is going to lead them to reject things perhaps longer than they should, to have a higher burden of proof than what is actually reasonable. So um, a minimal facts approach kind of eliminates that and places checks and balance on everyone involved because it's like, okay, these are facts we can all agree on. Now what do we do with these facts? And it makes it simpler. It just boils it down to, okay, what's the best explanation? And we might disagree on what's the best explanation of those facts, but we're not disagreeing on the facts. A maximalist approach says, all right, we take those, but you know, there's more that we could use. We could say, here's what John says, and here's what the gospels say. But then you really, you know, not all evidence is equally strong. That's not just for Christianity or the New Testament. It's for everything when it comes to history, right? Um, we know that the Reichstag burned in uh, 1933. But whether it was the communist who burned it or the Nazis burned it and, and, um, and, and blamed it on the communists in order to put Hitler in power, historians are divided on that. We don't know. But no one questions that the Reichstag burned. So, you know, what are the things we can agree on? But when you start adding these other things that aren't so strongly evidenced, well, you know, then you just can't have those same kind of discussions with everyone involved because now we're not agreeing on all the different things. So I think, you know, I, I, I forgot, I think I said it at uh, 
either to Julie earlier today on a podcast or a dinner tonight. Um, the maximalist approach, I think, is fine to use if you're teaching Sunday school or uh, on Sunday morning where you don't really have skeptics. You're preaching to the choir. And I do think that there's decent evidence that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote that gospel. So why should, why should I feel compelled in the right setting not to present that? Um, what I think is true in that sense. But if I'm going to be talking to another scholar or a sophisticated skeptic, I think the minimal facts approach is a better way to go. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you guys. Yes, sir. In your experience, what is the most effective way to help the everyday atheist become open to the resurrection of Christ? That's a good question. I mean, who's the everyday atheist? I mean, if you say, well, who's the everyday Christian? I'd say there's so many. I mean, there's some really stupid Christians out there <laughs> and, and, and weird Christians. And to help them to come to grips with some things is going to be different than if I'm talking to someone who's reasonable and, and intelligent. So who's the everyday atheist? I, I don't know. Um, I try to be, for me, I try to be as honest as I can be. I, I try to say, you know, I don't have to fear truth. So what's truth? And sometimes truth may point a, a, in a different direction than what I was brought up to believe or what I want to believe. It may lead me to think something that makes me uncomfortable, at least for that moment, until I, it's like jumping into a swimming pool and it's a little bit cool. It might take me a little bit, like my, my work on gospel differences, it made me uncomfortable at first. I became comfortable with it um, as I started to understand more about it. But, um, you know, so I try to be honest. I, I think the best thing that we can do when we're talking, uh, Christians, I, I don't know where you're coming from, so, but um, I, I would encourage Christians when you're talking to skeptics, be authentic and, and, and be a good person and, and show love toward that person because we should love them. We should, we should love him. Jesus loved, loved um, everyone. In fact, he told us in a Sermon on the Mount to love our enemies and pray for those persecuting us. So if we can do that, if we're to do that with our enemies, then certainly we should do it with atheists who are our friends. Um, so does that help? Yeah. I don't know that it's so much uh, the intellectual part there as the the pathos, the, the um, or I, I, not the pathos, the uh, ethos, to, to be a good person when you're, when you're interacting with the non-believer. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I can't formulate my question unless I answer a very short question. You, under point three, is it true? You had like an, an A and B. A, could you remind me what they were? Oh, sure. Uh, this one, is it true? Oh, what, what's that? Yeah, you, not a legend. Um, okay, and by that you mean it's not a story. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't something that developed. It wasn't um, a false story that developed over time. Okay. Now, hear me on this. That is not to say that I'm saying that there's nothing in the resurrection narratives that uh, were, let's say, the truth amplified, uh, you know, in some way. I'm not saying that the truth has been amplified in the, in the Gospels or the resurrection narratives. But what I'm saying, that doesn't prove that we don't have any legend in the Gospels. I'm just saying the claim that God raised Jesus from the dead and that these people had experiences they sincerely interpreted as the risen Jesus to them, that wasn't a legend. That goes back to the alleged eyewitnesses or to Jesus' disciples themselves. Are you suggesting that that the actual that we have historically true testimony that what they're saying like are you saying it's true that they that they said and believe that Jesus rose from the dead or you're saying from that evidence that it is true? Okay, so what I'm saying is Jesus we we can be certain that Jesus' disciples had experiences that were such a nature that they interpreted as being the risen Jesus appearing to them. 
okay? That is accepted by virtually all, even skeptical scholars who study the subject. Now, that's one of the things. Then you got Paul, all right? Jesus died, you got these experiences to individuals, to groups, to friend and foe. Now, what do we do with these facts? What's the best explanation for all of these? And my contention here is that Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection hypothesis, explains these facts better than any other hypothesis. When you subject it to arguments of inference to the best explanation. In other words, which hypothesis can account for all the facts, which can account for them without forcing them to fit or thinking, uh, given the truth of a hypothesis, you expect certain things. And to the extent that we get those things, that hypothesis is said to have explanatory scope. So given the truth that Jesus rose from the dead, what do we expect? Is that what we get? Absolutely. What if, let's say, um, uh, uh, they hallucinated? If they hallucinated, what would we expect if they hallucinated? Well, we wouldn't expect all of them to have a hallucinations. If, if only 7% of those typically grieving over the loss of a loved one experience a visual hallucination, then you get one, maybe two of the disciples who experience a visual hallucination of Jesus. You don't expect all of them. You certainly don't expect Paul to convert to Christianity. Um, what you would expect is that one, maybe two of them experience a visual hallucination of Jesus and the Christian movement dies just like every other messianic movement of that day and maybe Christianity becomes a footnote in future history books. That's what we ex would expect to happen if Jesus did not rise. That's not at all what we get. So that's explanatory power. Less ad hoc, you're looking at which hypothesis has the least amount of speculation or non-evidenced assumptions. And then finally, plausibility, which is um, compatible with our background knowledge the best. So I think when you put all those together, the resurrection hypothesis fulfills those criteria better than any other competing hypothesis. And that it had apostolic authority. Yeah. Um, do you believe that that's God's word still, like God's inspired word still, if it's Paul's take? I do. Okay. Yeah. And then, okay. And then uh, for other other books of the Bible, you you referenced how we talked about several epistles that were um, like very commonly supported and understood that these were like for sure written by Paul but other ones are do you have any concern about canonicity of second and third John Revelation they didn't think John the Apostle wrote Revelation so they kept them out for a while and then there were councils that came up and some of them said yeah let's include Revelation and others said nope and then they later on they said well okay and then even the Orthodox Church uh, it was only recently that they said, all right, we'll, we'll uh, include Revelation, but they don't read it in their worship services. Um, so these things, you know, we look things kind of myopically, like if you're Protestant and say, okay, we got these 66 books. How did it happen? Well, it was, they were chosen, you know, and councils de determine these over time. And then you get thinking, okay, well, councils determine it. Uh, we believe the, the Bible is divinely inspired. Scripture is divinely inspired, but do we think the councils were divinely inspired to choose these? Well, what evidence would there be? Why would we think these councils are divinely inspired? And if they were divinely inspired, then why did they disagree with one another? Why is it today that they still disagree? Catholics have the Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical books between the Old and New Testament. Um, you've got Orthodox Bible. They included it, that, that in there, but they don't say that they're inspired. Okay, Protestants leave them out. Well, why, why do they leave them out? Why do, okay, so the Catholic Church and the Council of Trent, I think it was 1546, somewhere around there, that they said, these books, this is it. This is our final, the canon is closed. Protestants never closed it. And Protestants didn't accept the Council of Trent because that was the Catholic Bible and it included the Apocrypha. So who's right on this? And why think that they're right? Oh, Protestants are right. Okay, well, 
So God guided them, but not the Catholics or the Orthodox. How do we know this? It becomes fuzzy. And then there are other questions involved. So we kind of deal with these questions in the book, some of these tough questions. And for some of them, it's hard to answer. So my view of canonicity has kind of changed a little over uh, of what, you know, and, and, and you start to think about, all right, why is it we have Hebrews in the Bible and we don't know who wrote it? Even in the third century, you've got a guy named Origen and he says, who wrote Hebrews? In truth, only God knows. So they didn't know back then. Um, but then you got Clement, first Clement, who's written, you know, either in the late 60s or early 90s. And he probably has ties to the Apostle Peter. And first Clement was included for a little, but later it was excluded. Well, it seems to me Clement would have a greater claim to canonicity than Hebrews would. But it wasn't chosen that way in the eyes of the early church. So, and then you say, well, what if we know Paul wrote some letters that we no longer have? What if one of those letters was discovered? Would we include it in the canon? Would we kind of open the canon and say, hey, let's add this? You know, we know for sure that our first and second Corinthians are actually second and fourth Corinthians. We're missing the first and third letter because Paul mentions a previous letter in first Corinthians. So what if the real first Corinthians was actually discovered? They said, well, but they had these criteria. Yeah, they did, but that was their criteria. How do we know that those criteria are right? That's what they decided. Um, and what if it had something valuable in it? I mean, what if Paul said, hey, I heard that uh, some of you read my letter that I wrote to the church at Rome and you're bickering amongst yourselves about what I mean by predestination and election. And I want to answer that and clarify it in this letter. Now, wouldn't that be awesome? So um, would we include this in our new Bibles? Can you imagine the controversies that would take place, the debates? You'd have some publishers that would put it in their Bibles and others say, Oh, that Zondervan, they're terrible. They're including that new letter of Paul in 1 Corinthians. Heret heretics, I'll never buy anything from Zondervan again. You know, things, it would, it would be great. I mean, it would be such a <laughs> cool time. So all I can say is the canon thing is, it's, it's a little fuzzy. So um, there's no firm answers on some of the things. Um, what, I, what I can say, if I'm being honest with you, is... I haven't taken the time to look at some of these disputed letters of Paul, like 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. The disputed letters, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Ephesians. Not many New Testament scholars think Paul wrote those. Now, I did spend some time looking at the Ephesians thing and why most scholars reject Pauline authorship of that. And I think that their reasons are just bogus. I think they're just easily, easily refuted. And I think Paul wrote Ephesians. I haven't studied the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. So I'll be honest with you, when I read them, uh, I don't give them as much weight as I give 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So you could call that a canon within the canon. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to the legend thing, I, uh, would it be uh, correct uh, to say that when you say it's not a legend, meaning that we have evidence so close to the event that is verifiable, that it didn't have time, like 200 years for a legend, they put it in there later on in the third or fourth century to, to say that, uh, to make it legend that Jesus was God and stuff like that. That's right. You can say that you could say the disciples were lying. And, you know, that's something we could answer. You could say they're hallucinating, something that we'd have to answer then. But it's the original alleged eyewitness. People who are claiming they were eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus. This isn't a legend that developed over time. Right. Uh, and going to that hallucination thing, I kind of have a, a funny story about that that kind of illustrates your point that it can't, mass hallucinations don't, come, don't happen, but maybe small very small one or two uh i was uh okay everybody calls your you didn't come to anium i didn't hear that in your uh, credentials so but everybody calls us a cult here and i say we're a good cult but 
we uh, when I was a kid and we, that my dad was a, a, a yell leader and we came down for a football game. My sister and I were uh, in our bedroom, in the hotel bedrooms. My mom and dad in one bed, me and my sister in another. We're like eight and six or something like that, eight and five. And uh, we're talking about the Aggie game together as we're asleep and back and forth and whooping and uh, touchdown Aggies or whatever, you know. I mean, it's really kind of my parents, it woke my parents up and they kid us about that to this day that we were carrying on a conversation in our sleeps about the Aggie football game. But uh, uh, stretch that into believing that every Aggie in that hotel room was recounting the same dream that my sister and I as little kids were, uh, you know, just af right after having this exciting event of an Aggie football game. But it'd be cr insane to believe that all the Aggies were having that same hallucination. And, uh, but, uh, it, I mean, is that kind of what you're saying about- uh, Yeah, plus you're hearing each other talking. I don't know how things work in sleep, yeah. you know? But there is some sense perception that's going on that if you're interacting with one another, you are talking to, to each other yeah. and you're hearing that. And I mean, it's like sometimes I've, I've had a dream that some crime or a fire is going on and there's a police car or fire engine in my dream. And then I wake up and sure enough, that fire engine or police car just went by. So it was the sound of that siren that interacted and caused me to have some of these, these dreams. And that's probably what was happening with you and your, your sister at that time. So, but these disciples, they're thinking that Jesus rose and they're seeing him, right? right? So it's an, not an auditory, it is a yeah. visual thing that's going on. 40 days. Well, yeah, that wouldn't be a minimal fact though, or you know, something that everyone would agree on. That's what's in the book of Acts. And that particular fact, not every scholar would grant that they were having these for 40 days. They would certainly say it happened over a period of time, but they might not say 40 days. That's not to say Book of Acts is false. It's just, that's not going to be one of those facts that is accepted by everyone. But the fact is you got 100%. I mean, what's the possibility that 100% of the people in this room right now, if we all went to sleep, um, if I keep talking, that's going to happen, right? We're all going to go sleep. But if we all fell asleep and we all had the same dream simultaneously, and that dream was so similar, we all believed we had the same dream. That's just not going to happen. But that's kind of what it would require, right? Yeah. All right. And while I'm sure that was all agreed that Dr. McClellan would not put us to sleep, <laughs> uh, it is unfortunately time for us to bring it close to this talk, so uh, everyone give a hand.